for the word. I pray that you'll speak to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That he will be the leader and the director of our life. That we will be sensitive to his gentle promptings, to his admonitions and to his encouragement. For he seeks to lead us deeper into the knowledge of our Savior Jesus and to reveal to us the truth and the guidance we receive from the living Word of God. Open our hearts, Lord, and make us receptive to what the Spirit would say to the church this morning. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll begin this morning in Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 12, and then move through just a few verses this morning. In 2001, 81.6% of the American population, according to the surveys that were taken, considered themselves to be Christians. More recently, in 2015, instead of 81.6%, only 75% believe that the Bible is the Word of God and believe that they're Christians. Interestingly enough, though, when you get took at it a little differently, 47% of the Americans who were surveyed believe the Bible is somewhat inspired, but only 24% according to this survey, believe that the Bible is literally the inspired word of God and the final authority for Christian life. We're seeing a great decline, and there's a great difference between saying that I'm a Christian and saying that I'm not a Christian. I could stand here this morning and tell you that all my life I've been underfed, and nobody would believe me. Because the evidence proves otherwise. Just a mountain of muscle, soft muscles, unfortunately. But the fact of the matter is, is that the scripture teaches us that if we are truly a Christian, we are not led by the mind, which is the soul, nor the cultural mores, but we are led by the spirit of God. The scripture talks about the body, the soul, and the spirit, the flesh. It also talks about the relationship that we can have with God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, the Bible said, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you are going to die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the, of the body, then you shall live. So the Bible says that if we live after the flesh, the flesh is a way of describing what we inherited from Adam, our father. He was of the flesh. He was flesh and blood like you and I are. And he had the capacity to live righteously or the capacity to choose not to be fully obedient to God. It's an interesting thing that if we think if I'm obedient to God in certain areas of my life, but not other areas of life, that I'm okay. That's not really what the scripture teaches. For it says, living after the flesh, you will die. And people think the flesh offers life. The things that I want to do, the things that I desire to do, but that I know I must not do. We are in that constant battle that's going on. Constantly knowing, after we've been a Christian for a while and have knowledge of the Word, knowing what we should and should not do, what we should spend our time and our life with, what we should permit ourselves to do and not to do, it's a constant battle that goes on. And the Spirit, Bible said, the Spirit helps us put to death or break the power of the flesh and put God in control of our lives by His Holy Spirit. It's not what I get up in the morning. It's not important what I want to do, what I think I should do, what we should think we should do. But what does God have for me today? Will the Holy Spirit be the one that leads my life? Or will it simply be my human being, my flesh, the, in the instincts, the desires that come out of my own, my own life? Can I, am I going to do what God wants me to do? Or am I going to do what I want to do, 
Hopefully we can reach a point in our life what we want to do is what God wants us to do, and that's when the peace and joy and love and fellowship with God begins to bear great fruit in our life. Paul talks us that not, we are not only saved by the work of the Spirit, but that we must walk by the Spirit. We must let the Spirit be the one who guides and directs our lives. The Scripture talks about this in uh, the book of, of, uh, of Galatians chapter 3. And it tells us that all of us have a spirit. And our spirit is where God leads us and God deals with us and where the Holy Spirit wants to make direct the paths of our lives. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 2, it tells us that there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. So when we're talking about being sons of God, as we go through this context, yes, God is our earthly father. He created us. He created Adam. We, we come to, to add, through Adam by the flesh. But he is our spiritual father, our spiritual leader. And the scripture teaches us that the spirit is neither male nor female. That's what the scripture says in Galatians 3, 2. The scripture said, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit are you now made perfect by the flesh we start out having a spiritual revelation that jesus is god and he comes into our life we say lord forgive me of the things that separate me from you the sins the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye the pride of life arrogance selfishness all of the things that the Ten Commandments warn us against, and yet we continue from time to time to break them because there's a constant battle going on. It never ends. Does it mean that every time we sin, we're kicked out of the family? No. First time your child disobeys you, do you put them out on the porch and say you're on your own? No. You try to change. You try to channel their lives. You try to direct them in, in, a, in a better way to live than live in constant rebellion. And so Paul's talking about this. He says that we're the sons of God when God's spirit rules and guides and directs our life. Verses 14 and 15 of Romans chapter 8 says, Living in the spirit means living as a child of God. And so for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We begin to recognize when the spirit of God gives us spiritual birth through the sacrifice of Jesus, that we have a father. And that father is God. Abba is the, is the Aramaic for the a child, like a child would say Abba. And, of course, it's translated father from the Greek. But it was, is the question that we all have to ask ourselves when we go about our daily life. Am I being led by the Spirit or being led by my own mind, my own desires, my own, my own longings, my flesh? Is God the one who is actually my Lord? What does that mean, Lord? It means the final say about everything in my life. So if my flesh tempts me to do something and I know that it is contrary to what God's purpose for my life, then I have to make a choice. Will I be obedient to my flesh or will I be obedient to God? God has given us the right to that choice. Now, when we make the wrong choice, it doesn't mean we're instantly cast out of the family, but it damages our relationship with God and hinders us from fulfilling the purpose for which God created us in the beginning. We only have so much time so much influence, so many resources, so much strength. How do we share it? How do we spend it? It's like it says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for God will last. All of the achievements, all of the things that we have and accomplish and lay our hands on, none of those things that, of the, are, that are of the earth we take with us. But to know God, we have to be spiritual. We let, have to let Christ, by his Holy Spirit, come in, take control of our spirit. 
And so when it's talking about the sons of God, it's not talking about just boys or men. If you're a woman here today, it's going to may come as a shock to you. But as far as God is concerned, you're also a son. So if I greet you and say, hello, son, how are you? You'll know it's biblical. You can accept that. I'm not casting dispersions on your gender. The gender is of the flesh. We are spiritual. When we get to heaven, we're not, we're not going to be male or female. We're going to be all of us. And this is kind of hard on the, on the, on the men because God balances it out. He says, we're going to be the bride of Christ. I have a hard time thinking of myself as a bride. I wouldn't know what to wear. And I don't ever want anybody thinking about me as a bride either. I'll tell you that. Not that I'm, not that that's a problem. Yes. Is my life led by the spirit? Am I being directed and guided by the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life? The scripture tells us that within us, we can deceive ourselves because the heart is desperately wicked. We can think, okay, I can live like this, though I know it is contrary to God's word and everything's going to be fine. And everything's not fine. When we're walking, knowing the truth and not living and following the spirit, but are in the flesh, we damage ourselves and we damage every other person in our life. And we also lose the ability to influence those people that God specifically created us to influence more effectively than any other human being on the face of the earth. I always am interested when somebody says, I, God's given me such a burden for this person. They just need to know something about the Lord. And, and, and I want you to come talk to him, Pastor. Well, God didn't, God didn't call you to be a messenger. He called you to go do the job. You say, but I'm not equipped. If the Holy Spirit leads you, you're equipped. The scripture says that in that moment, even if you're in a, in a perilous time where you're being grilled by some person of power or influence, he said, in that moment, I'll call the words to mind. It is, it is what God does in our lives and through our lives when we're led by the spirit that brings fulfillment to us and brings fruit. We begin to bear fruit unto God. And so the question is, am I led by the spirit? Am I following what God wants, desires of me, or am I dominated by my own flesh? Now, the scripture says that we, when we come to God, are not in bondage to sin. We, we don't have to sin. We don't have to do it. You say, I can't help it. Yes, you can. If you are truly led by the Spirit and will listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, the Scripture says when you're tempted, you're going to be tempted. That's just a part of getting up in the morning. You're going to be tempted. But the Bible said with every temptation, he has provided a way of escape. Do you take the way of escape or does your flesh say, I'd rather go over here because I really want to do this. I really want to have this. You know, I'm under grace, so everything's fine. That's kind of a it's kind of a sad way to live, a dangerous way to live. In the Roman world in the first century, an adopted son would have all of the rights and privileges and the inheritance of the birth child, the birth son. There were so many times that because of their years of war and all of the slaughter that took place that many Romans suddenly found themselves with no male heir, which was important in that culture. And so they would adopt a son. And when they adopted that son, he had the full rights of that family. I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times my dad would say to me when I'd say, I'm going to want to do something that I knew that wasn't, he wouldn't like, that he believed was unscriptural, and even if I didn't agree with him, he would say, son, and I'd always say the same thing that didn't get me anywhere. I've said it many times. He said, son, other, everybody else can do it, and it's all right. Everybody except you. And sometimes my heavenly father says that to me too. Maybe it's all right for everybody else, but it's not all right for you. 
The scripture says, how shall we escape getting ourselves in constant mess if we neglect such a great salvation? The Bible likens our lives about a house in many, in many places in scripture. And there's something about a house that if you don't maintain it, things begin to deteriorate. The paint wears off. There's cracks in the wall. It's a constant battle. If you, if you don't really believe that, then here's an experiment I want you to take. Go one week without taking out the trash, without sweeping the floor, without mopping things. Just, just one week. Just don't do anything to maintain where you live. And then all of a sudden you look like a college student. I mean, you live like, you look like somebody. Clothes everywhere, mildew, rust, you know, it just begins to fall apart. And it happens so gradually that you don't really notice it. And you neglect it for so long and then all of a sudden it's apparent to everybody else. I remember a time when we had, when well, we've always had dogs and we've always paid the price. Let me tell you something. Dogs are expensive and troublesome and destructive and I just love them. I don't know why. I guess because they remind me of my fallen nature. There's also jealous beyond measure. They just have, they just manifest flesh because that's what they are, flesh. I can't even hug my wife Mary when she's sitting on the couch without my 80-pound dog sticking his head between us and pushing me away. He resents it. He doesn't want me to have anything to do with her. He protects Mary when we had an attempt at home invasion. He tore those people apart. He growled. He jumped. They literally left. We had four men try to come into our home, and she was there alone with Luke. And Luke was so ferocious that they got in the car and got out of there, even before the police got there. But I was out there with some bunch of guys that were kind of being yammering at me. And Luke just sat there. <laughs> he didn't care. You know, I'm the one that makes him mine, so I'm the boss, so I can handle it, you know. But Mary, you know, that's his treasure. We're all God's treasure. He wants to protect us. God, you say, well, God, what, why does God hate sin so much? Because he knows how deadly it is. How deadly it is. He hates it. Just like you hate anything that would hurt your child. Anything that would destroy or bring harm or suffering to them. That's why God hates sin is because he loves us. And the scripture said, I will not, God says it in the scripture, I will not withhold any good thing from you. I shared that with a young guy that was determined to marry this girl that was not only not a Christian, but she had no intention of ever becoming a Christian. And I said to him, I said, look, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It'll make you both miserable. It'll put you in conflict. It will rob you of your effectiveness in the work of God and the kingdom of God. And I said, not only that, I told you, God will not withhold any good thing for you, but you don't know how good she is. He was just besotted and smitten. And he went ahead and, and they got married and she never did come to Christ. And they had a miserable life that ended together, their life together ended after about eight years of terribly violent, conflicted marriage, not physically violent, but just disagreements. So she said, I'm not, I'm through with you. Why did God want him to turn away from that relationship? Because he loved him. And because that he knew, he knew, God knew, that this would render this man who had been a dedicated, committed Christian, this young man, it would render him fruitless and ineffective in the battle against the powers of darkness. He was not led by the spirit. He was led by the flesh. I tell young people that are talking about going into the ministry something that I heard a long time ago, but it's true. Who you marry, who you marry, will determine what kind of ministry you will have. 
you will either marry someone that will be a walking with you and sacrificing with you and going through it and thank God for the privilege and joy of having God lead somebody, lead us to somebody like that. Or the person you marry will be your ministry. You'll spend your whole life trying to please them and not please God. Let's, let's give of, let's give of our service to God. I don't want to, I want to, I want to do something else. And it's all right if you, you want to go and everything, just come on home and I'll have a pillow on the couch waiting for you so, uh, or whatever. Conflict. Are we led by the Spirit in every aspect of our life? A woman in Samaria asked Jesus, where do we worship God? And his answer is, in our spirit. Our spirit reaches out to God. I I talked to a, a, an old friend. I hadn't talked to him in, I, I don't know when, at a funeral I preached. It was, was uh, eight years ago. And he's, I just love the guy. He's a great guy. And uh, he called me unexpectedly yesterday, and I, I was pleased to hear from him, surprised. And anyway, he, he said, I just, I just want to let you, he was just very kind, I appreciate you, and so forth and so on. And, uh, and he said, I, 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 not, I believe in God, but he said, as you know, I don't go to church. I, don't, I just don't go to church. I can't, I can't go to church. He said, it's nothing against church. He said, but the few times I've had to go to church or been to church, he said, it doesn't matter what kind of church it is or what they're doing. He says, I just begin to sob and I get embarrassed. I just can't do it. He said, I don't know why. And I said to him, I, I think I know why. Because the scripture said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. I said, it is your spirit crying out for more, a deeper relationship with God whom you believe in and whom you say you love. But that's what God is doing. That's why when we come together and that we sing these wonderful songs of praise, the Holy Spirit leads us into a deeper consciousness of God and, and an awareness that our spirit is just vibrating with life and joy and peace. And I'll tell you what, that's why the Bible said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially as those days grow shorter. Don't do it. There's nothing more important. And if you're one of those guys that are tempted to sit home and watch football, the scriptures, the Bible teaches us that when temptation comes, God will provide a way of escape and he's provided a way of escape. You can record it. But you can't substitute anything for being together with believers and hearing the word and worshiping God together. Scripture bears witness. The flesh deals with the intellect. The spirit deals with the spirit and guides us and leads us. So... If we're a son of God, we are led by the Spirit. So now, how, how does the Spirit lead us? Well, first of all, when the Spirit begins to lead you, you will develop an appetite, a spiritual hunger for the Scripture, for the Word of God. When you get to the point you're not interested in reading the scripture on a regular basis, it is a danger sign to your spiritual health, my spiritual health. People say, God doesn't speak to me. That's what the Bible is. Every word, every page is God speaking to us. 
And anything that God says to us, whether we receive it through an emotional response to something or in any other way, anything that we receive that is is supposedly of God that is contrary to the Scripture is not of God, period. The Word of God. And it is powerful, and it's sharper than two-edged sword, dividing the soul and the spirit until you'll know what is of the soul, the flesh, and you'll know what is of the spirit. The Holy Spirit then will lead you and guide you into all truth. That's what the Bible said. When he, the spirit of come of truth, has come, he will lead you into truth. The truth is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's, that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's how he works. Chuck Smith wrote, he said, how glorious is it to walk in the Spirit, to be in union with the Spirit of God, to be led by the Spirit of God, and to have the glorious assurance of God's Spirit bearing witness to mine. Hey, you're a child of God, and I'm telling you, there's nothing more comforting in times of stress or need. Hey, wait a minute, you're a child of God, and there's no temptation that's taken that is greater than the God that you serve. There is no circumstance that is beyond God's help and deliverance. It doesn't matter whether it's life or death or whatever, God is always there, and His Spirit leads us. Then another thing the Spirit does, He gives us understanding of the Word of God. How many times have you read the same Bible, the same area of Scripture over and over again? All of a sudden, it's speaks to you and you get so excited wow I yes Lord you know years ago I had a lady come up to me and and we had a guest speaker and um, he 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 talked about uh, John 316 and she came up afterwards and she was just glowing she says I finally understood The scripture this man preached on John 6, 316, she says, why have you never touched on John 6, 316 in the two years that I've been here? Then the flesh had a little battle. But anyway, no, I didn't care because that's when the Holy Spirit told her about Jesus. That's when the scripture became life because the living spirit brought the living word into her dead soul and resurrected it when she repented of her sins and asked Christ to come into her life. And so as far as she is concerned, she heard it for the first time. The first time. If you're led by the spirit, you're under the spirit's control. If we're led by the flesh, we're under the flesh control. When I have decisions to make, I try very hard not to make decisions relating to my life, to the church, until I know I'm being led by the Spirit. I know that right now in my life that God is leading me to make changes in the way and the patterns of our worship. The things that we emphasize. But I'm not going to make any changes until I'm absolutely certain, Lord. I know you're leading me, but I want to make sure that this is not something that's going on in my mind between my ears, but it's something you're leading me to do because you've given me the responsibility as shepherd. And the only way I can lead is if I'm led. If I lead, it's a disaster. If I follow the Spirit and lead people where the Spirit leads, it is blessing, peace, fruitfulness, and fulfillment. Sometimes as Christians, we get into patterns of life. And we never ever think about maybe God is through with this activity or this whatever we're doing and he wants something new something different the thing that will wear us out more than anything else in the spiritual world is to continue in the flesh doing something that the spirit once led us to do but God is through with it now One of the hardest things for us in the early days of the warehouse, we had thousands of people come to Christ through the concerts, week after week, month after month. But there came a time when the concerts were no longer fruitful. We weren't reaching the lost. It was just a Christian cheerleading 
session. We weren't communicating with the lost. And then music tastes began to break up until young people would only want one certain type of music. And finally, we realized this ministry is not fruitful anymore. But we carried it on for a year when it was unfruitful because of the pattern. I believe God has wonderful things for us. He's blessed us. The Holy Spirit is moving. We've, we've, we've gone through some changes recently, unexpected. And, and now, God, now God is just blessing us amazingly. I had no idea uh, six months ago that God would want, want us to, as a church to become involved in encouraging and leading the churches in Calvary Chapels in Northern California and Nevada. But I had the joy this week of talking to and getting ready to bring in the third new Calvary Chapel since in the few months that I've been here. They've met all the requirements. And now there'll be three more. God does these things. God leads. And I want to tell you something else that happened. You're the most loving, giving, serving people I've ever known in my life. And I mean that because it's true. And anybody that says it's not true is of the flesh. But I mentioned it before. I cannot, I don't want to rob you of your, your blessing, but I cannot tell you as I've talked to different pastors and I get here from some during the week, the way you ministered to these men and women who are serving God in their churches has inspired them and encouraged them and renewed them and God powerfully used this church. How privileged we are. And I find such joy in it. There's so many other things that God has for us. The Spirit leads us to pray. Sometimes I reach a point where I just have to get alone and pray. I have this desire. I pray. And then sometimes I'm out with, with people who are not Christians, and I want to I have an influence over them. But then all of a sudden, I just have this hunger. I want to be with fellow Christians. I want to be encouraged and strengthened. But I also am led sometimes to get out of my comfort zone and go out and try to hang out with people who I know are not Christians, but who need the love of God manifested to them through my life, through my fellowship. Being led by the Spirit. What does the Bible say? Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God has given us the power by the Holy Spirit to honor and serve Jesus every day of our life, to get into the Word and have Him reveal truth to us that will lay answers and give direction to all of the decisions that we make. That will make us recognize that my life is not my own. My time is not my own. I belong to God. I am to be a servant of God and to follow where he leads me, to pasture where he feeds me, and all of those things that we sing about, but they're still true. And I'll follow all the way, Lord. I'll follow Jesus every day. That's what I'm led and called to do. And the only way I can do that is to be sensitive to the Spirit and to recognize when my flesh takes over and I become crazy critical or jealous or become desirous of something that somebody else have covetous or what all of the Ten Commandments begin to kick in and suddenly we rejoice. I'll tell you one other thing that happened to me and I'll just close with this and it probably uh, that's called a caveat but anyway this friend of mine that talked to me he said you know Lewis he said you know years ago we went fly fishing together uh, catching trout on on fly fishing flies. And he said, I recognize that, uh, he said, I was in New Zealand recently playing golf with some friends, and he said, I left New Zealand, and I, I just loved hearing this, but he said, I recognize it's one of the great trout fishing places in the world, and I hadn't even taken a fly rod with me. So he said, I met a friend of mine at a high school reunion, older guys, it must be, because it was 60-year reunion, and he likes to fly fish. And then he went on telling me about where he is going. Boy, it was hard listening to that. He said, we're going to a five-star lodge. We'll be there five days, fish four days. And they catch rainbow trout and brown trout from 8 to 20 pounds. All right, Lord. Hmm. 
All right. He's not that good a fisherman. He's not worthy to catch a 20-pound trout. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't care. I honestly don't. I'm happy for him. But if God leads me, I know God has good things for all of us. So how about just a suggestion? When you wake up in the morning, say, Lord, what do you have for me today? Lead me by your spirit. And let him lead you to a few chapters in the Bible. And let him speak to you through the word.